kick it off the list at number 10, Smokey Behind. When somebody tells you that you're just blowing smoke, it means that you're lying, okay? You've now been given exaggerated information of sorts. Well, back in the 18th century, they literally had to blow tobacco smoke at your behind. Yeah, weirdest work break ever, I'd say. So why did we perform magician enemas back in the day? What was the deal here? Well, tobacco smoke enemas were used to treat quite a few symptoms, or they thought so, including a common cold. These enemas came in these fancy kits with a fancy rubber tube. It was all fancy because it was an honest medical practice at the time. It was done by legit medical practitioners. This is the funniest part. The idea was that the tobacco smoke could warm up a soon to be deceased body. The nicotine would stimulate your adrenal glands, jolting you back into good health. The best health, might we say. And the way they would do it in the mid 1800s was by just blowing smoke and just waiting, seeing what happened. We're figuratively and literally blowing smoke. That's the origin of that saying, fun fact there. Imagine doing that today. Like, eh, I think I dislocated my shoulder. What do I do? He's like, eh, one sec. Number nine, alarm clocks. While the medical world was one threat in Victorian times, apparently so was the technological side. Who knew? We obviously didn't have reliable alarm clocks back in the 1800s, obviously, but we did have jobs. So in order to get up on time, lamp lighters or knockers would come by and tip you off. Yeah, they would just yell in your window and just alarm. That's how you'd wake up. A man would yell into your window and smack you with a stick. Legend has it a young man named Sam Wardell, he got a little creative with his wake up calls. He needed more than a lamp lighter at 5 a.m. So he would Tony Stark this alarm clock gadget. He would use wires, a bunch of stones, all that unsafe stuff. Then at a certain time, stones would fall to the ground, of course, waking him up and presumably everyone else in the building. That would be alarming. Well, Christmas Eve, 1885, tragedy unfolded. A few friends had come over for a holiday visit. So Sam had to move some furniture around, rightfully so, to make room for, you know, windmills and break dancing, whatever they did in Victorian Christmas times. The next morning, he forgot to put things back in the small apartment and the obvious happened. The rocks then fell on him while he was asleep. Yeah, that probably doesn't feel too good. I thought iPhone alarms were jarring. I take back everything I've ever said. Number eight, the products of our sins. Having fun when the lights can be turned off is great. Who doesn't enjoy a little toe curling, yeah? Except sometimes there's this crazy thing that can happen where after nine months, another human spawns in. Insane, right? I know. Well, back in the Victorian era, this phenomenon was happening, but only for married couples. As you have to be married, of course, or else a child would be born out of wedlock, which to people at the time was just the worst. Oh, I never. These stigmas were not favorable for women, as some preferred to avoid that kind of press by abandoning or straight up just unaliving their children. Horrible, just, just horrible times. Just another one of those good old wholesome times in history where we were treating women with the utmost respect and decency. Very nice. We were actually not very nice. Number seven, diet. Bedroom misconduct was becoming a huge issue. Refer to number nine and 10. While women did get most of the blame because, well, you know, history, men did get some of the blame. The issue of intimacy for men could be described as barbaric primal sense. So how do we curb this? How do we stop men from acting on these caveman urges, ooga booga? Well, simple really. Men just have to stop eating certain foods, as it was thought at the time that food had a link to the misconduct, or rather, the overabundance of bedroom related issues, including mustard, pepper, rich gravy, beer, wine, cider, and tobacco. And if you weren't paying attention, that's basically the diet of every man in Victorian times. Not sure how a jar of finely prepped mustard would get you flustered, but okay, sure. The beer makes sense though, you know, have a few beers, and even the mop leaning over the corner looks pretty lonely, and boy, that mop has lovely hair. Number six, job market. Ladies of the evening, women of the night. Women who make beds go bump in the night. They were everywhere in Victorian London, a lot. It's partially related to some of the points I previously mentioned. Now, I'm not here to say it's necessarily a bad thing. Personally, I don't think it is. As they say, it's the oldest profession in the book, with an estimated 80,000 women working in the night by the late 1890s. You'd have to be crazy to miss that. I mean, they, they were literally everywhere. With numbers like that, there's something for everyone and in varying price ranges, as they can be found in brothels or townhomes set up by the wealthy men for their mistresses, pretty much anywhere trouble likes to spawn. Even some artists took advantage of this by living with the gorgeous girls of the evening, as going behind closed doors with one was debatable, but becoming friends, now that's a social transgression. That, oh, becoming friend, oh, how dare you befriend the people of the night. 
Number 5, Jolly Lad. When people think about certain magazines that depict lewd imagery, you probably only think of Playboy. The bunny imagery was good marketing, honestly, just, just smart. But what if I told you the Hefmeister wasn't the first to publish such a magazine or imagery? Back in the Victorian era, there was some saucy imagery being produced. The government had outlawed such indecency, but this only made the lewd picture industry move underground, where naturally it flourished, especially in major cities. And if you knew where to go and and how to ask for one, you could purchase something from the hidden menu. Kind of like when you go to McDonald's. Yeah, there's a hidden menu there too. Google it and see for yourself. I'd repeat what my favorite one is, but I would be in trouble from the YouTube gods. And I've been treading on thin ice this whole video, so. Uh. Number four, the first counterculture. The 1960s were a very important time for many different people. Black Americans were fighting for the rights, music went from holding hands to strawberry fields, if you know what I'm saying, and everything that your parents told you just, just kind of felt wrong. If you grew up then, you know what I mean. I know people like to make fun of hippies, but there were some good ideas there. Well, in 1890s England, they were sort of having the same thing happen. Obviously, not as strong as a push as it was in the 60s, but still. Basically, after all the oppression towards bedroom relations, people began to open up. Uh, not literally, just, just open up thinking-wise. That's really gross, don't repeat that. There's only one way we all got here. Unless you're a test tube baby, of course. In that case, thank you for watching CT133576-2. To some historians, this makes sense. When you push and push for things to happen or ban, eventually people will push back, especially if it's something like bedroom time. Everybody, everybody likes a little bit of bedroom time. Valentine's Day wasn't too long ago. Remember that? It was good. It was fun. It was good, good fun. Number three, Jack the Ripper. While the man's numbers don't compare to any of the other horrible people in history, he's unusual because of his brutality and the fact that he was never caught. Jack the Ripper was maybe the first modern serial on a liver. He haunted the streets of Victorian London and is responsible for claiming multiple women's lives, women of the evening to be exact, and they began to know the name Jack the Ripper. Now we'll probably just have to show you pictures of Victoria London or maybe some b-roll of a shadowy figure because there ain't no way we can show the crime scenes. There's probably a dozen different theories on who done it. Some say it was multiple men using his name as an alias, some say it was Prince Albert, there's even some who suggest that he was a she, and which explains why women were so easy to go off with Jack. That actually kind of makes sense to me at least and why no one really would be looking for a woman back then. Kind of makes sense. Anyway, be careful out there ladies, just, just be careful. Number two, Queen Victoria. It seems old blighty herself may have been a tad more promiscuous than you'd think a royal to be. Well, not with other men, but her husband. Who in her diary claims to be the love of her life, which honestly is kind of sweet and, and romantic, that's nice. One thing that I find interesting, however, is that while lewd images were outlawed, the queen may have commissioned a painting of herself that was quite risque for the time. To gift to her husband, of course. Hypocrisy much? I say lewd, but it was probably just in her loose fitting clothes with maybe like an ankle showing or something. Still, unusual behavior for the queen. I'll remember that the next time, Bly. I'll remember that. Number one, Prince Albert. If you've ever stepped foot into a tattoo parlor, then you might know where I'm going with this. Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria, had some controversy circulating his name. One, because he shares a name with another Prince Albert, who was speculated to be Jack the Ripper, but also because of a very unique piercing. Go ahead and take a guess where that piercing is. Yeah, I didn't think so. As a man, if your anatomy could be described by an internet comedian using moderately funny euphemisms, then the piercing would go through your German army helmet. That makes sense, right? The horror. The absolute horror. It's rumored that he had one of these piercings. Did he? I, I'm not sure. But if it means anything to you, Nicholas II had a tattoo, so it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. Number 10, it's just a cold sore. The Victorian era is cool. The art, the fashion, and technology of the time, I think, are always fun to take a look at, especially since steampunk has its roots in the Victorian era. And who doesn't like steampunk? Come on, there's just a lot of cool steampunk stuff. And honestly, we haven't seen a lot of that in a long time. We need, we need more, we need more. Something not so cool from that era, however, was what you could catch from another person should you decide to take up a bed with another person. Syphilis, yep, one heck of a disease. Funny enough, it was so common that it was making intimacy itself an unusual practice. People were scared, and honestly, maybe rightfully so. There's no cure, and if it progresses to its later stages back then, well, you'd go crazy. And then you end up being that guy that's always screaming in the streets. Every city has one. You know what I'm talking about. Number nine, the French letter. 
The issues of intimacy and its repercussions were becoming quite clear in the Victorian era. Something had to be done, as spending any amount of time in the brothels could have you shucking barnacles off your lower deck in the morning, if you know what I mean. Introducing the revolutionary new invention, prophylactics. For those that are college age, you might find it disturbing that these party favors weren't made of rubber or disposable. Yeah, hear me out. They were made of sheep's guts and they had to be soaked first so they would become flexible. Because when you put these bad boys on, they had to be fastened on. It's not very good, not very attractive. Once the deed had been signed off on, the device was then washed and then hung up to dry like your dirty laundry. Once it was dry, it was placed in a small box for the next time. Because seeing your wife's ankles might make you feel a certain kind of way and now you just have it ready to go and. At number eight, mental health. Back in the Victorian era, the study of the human brain and psyche was still relatively new, so no one really knew what was going on up in people's noggins. Mental asylums started to pop up, and people started getting diagnosed with mental problems, even if the diagnosis wasn't accurate. The three labels that a patient could fall under were the manic, the melancholic, and those with dementia. The symptoms for those big three labels often varied, and people were admitted to asylums for some pretty messed up reasons. There was a list of common causes for mental illness that people referred to back then, and it included things like, quote, laziness, novel reading, superstition, an immoral life, and intemperance, as well as the act of self-pleasuring. For women, they could also be sent to asylums for some pretty ridiculous reasons, like imaginary female trouble, hysteria, rumor of husband murder, and even fits of desertion of husband. I am so glad things have changed since then. At number seven, grave robber. When you think of jobs back in the Victorian era, you might think of things like chimney sweeps and lawyers. But another relatively popular, though questionable, profession was being a grave robber. Yes, people actually made a living off robbing graves. As people studied medicine, they needed cadavers to practice on, but there was a law saying that only the bodies of those who had been executed for a crime could be used as a cadaver. And since the laws changed to include less and less crimes having death penalties, soon people started running out of cadavers to practice on, and this gave way to the boom in the grave robbing industry. People can make a pretty penny for snatching bodies from cemeteries and selling them to medical professionals and students. Fresher bodies went for more money, and the grave robbers not only made money off the sale of the cadaver, but they also charged a fee, so they ended up with a little extra cash in their pockets. Eventually, the grave robbing business became such a big problem that cemeteries started installing watchtowers and guards to prevent people from getting away with the dead. At number six, beauty. I've talked about this before in some past videos, but the Victorian era was famous for its strange beauty practices, so I just had to include it on this list. You're probably familiar with the makeup from the Victorian era. Women often painted their faces white to look as pale as possible, but even though they believed it made them look beautiful, it also did a lot of harm to their health. The white face paint that women would use was lead based, and as we all by now, lead makes you dead. But this white lead paint isn't the only thing that harms people's skin. Women would also wash their faces with ammonia to make their skin look paler. At night, women would rub opium on their faces, and if they were really dedicated to their beauty regime, they would also ingest arsenic. They were literally poisoning themselves in the name of beauty. Women would also use mercury on their eyebrows and eyelashes, and would use lemon juice or belladonna in their eyes, which could cause blindness in some people. Once again, I'm glad things have changed. At number five, no divorce. Nowadays, divorce is quite common. All you have to do is sign a paper and you're done. But back in the Victorian era, before the Matrimonial Causes Act of 1857 allowed divorce, people had to find different ways of getting rid of their spouses. After all, just because there was no divorce doesn't mean that everyone was happy in their marriages. It turns out that in order to solve their problems and get rid of their spouse, people would just sell their wives, either in public or in private sales. Most of the time, a man would take his wife to the town square and just sell her off to a new man. According to to some records, some women had the power to veto a sale, and sometimes it was for cash. Though I think the cheapest that a wife was ever sold for was a pint of beer. This wasn't necessarily bad for the woman, because if she was sold to someone else, things could sometimes work out and she could live a better life with a better spouse. And if she didn't, then she would just get sold again and get to try her luck with a new man. At number four, food additives. These days, people are becoming more and more concerned with artificial additives in their food. All natural, organic, pesticide, and hormone-free food 
food is becoming more and more popular, but back in the Victorian era, people were putting all kinds of additives in their noms, and a lot of it was really, really bad for you. Like, we're talking deadly. Chalk and alum were often added to bread dough to make it whiter, and sometimes pipe clay, plaster of Paris, or sawdust was added to the mix as well. Red lead was sometimes added to cheese, lead was added to cider, mustard, wine, sugars, and candies, copper sulfates were used in preserving fruits, jams, and wine, mercury was used in candies, and even ice cream was made using a water and chalk mixture. All of these unsafe ingredients are actually what prompted the food safety industry because no matter what's going on, you shouldn't be eating lead, chalk, and mercury. At number three, corpse medicine. Now earlier I mentioned the whole grave robber industry and how that really took off during the Victorian era, but now let's talk about how they used corpses in their medicine. Back then, some people believed that consuming certain parts of the human body could cure their ailments. I know. Gross, right? One of the more popular medicines back then was a mixture made with human skull and chocolate, and it was believed to cure apoplexy. Back in the Victorian era, medical texts were published describing what parts of the human body could be used to treat specific ailments. One text described mixing the skull of a young woman with treacle to treat epilepsy. Another text says that you could treat paralysis with a candle made of human fat. Apparently, executioners were linked to this type of medicine as they would, you know, execute someone and then use the remains to become a doctor and treat people's illnesses. Imagine Grey's Anatomy, but with Victorian medicine. Sounds like an interesting thing to watch, but also probably not to experience. At number two, mummies. Speaking of dead people though, people from the Victorian era were oddly fascinated with mummies. I mean, I can understand the fascination to a certain extent because they're old and cool, but of course, these people just had to be extra weird and take that obsession with mummies to heights that they didn't need to be. People used ground up mummies to make paint, Pieces of mummies were sold in jars, and they were even used in advertising. One candy shop put a mummy on display in the store, claiming that it was the daughter of a pharaoh who saved baby Moses. I mean, that's weird, right? I understand that this was all happening as archaeologists were starting to uncover lost treasures and secrets from Egypt, but I mean, a mummy in a candy shop? Seems a little much. And finally at number one, baby farmers. Now for what I believe is probably the most disturbing thing from the Victorian era, baby farmers. Basically, this was an industry of women who would take unwanted babies and either take care of them, give them to new parents, or unfortunately have them disposed of. One famous case of the darker side of baby farmers comes from a woman named Amelia Dyer. She was known to have charged women a lot of money to take their babies off their hands, but unfortunately the children wouldn't survive Amelia's care. It is believed that Amelia was responsible for the passings of hundreds of babies, making her one of the biggest monsters of the Victorian era. Now before we wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me if you would ever want to take a trip back in time to visit the Victorian era, and if so, what's one thing that you wish you could see? Leave me your thoughts down in the comments. At number 10, death photography. Has anyone out there looked at really old photos and had that eerie thought that everyone in that photo is dead now? I have. I know it sounds kind of weird, but it's just something that comes to mind sometimes. Back in the Victorian era though, they really had that thought because death photography became a trend at the time. Back then, people were dropping like flies. They dealt with a lot of illnesses like measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, rubella, typhus, and cholera. Death was all around them, but with the rise of photography, this became a new way of keeping a memento of their loved one who passed away. Before this, they would keep locks of hair and other items from their loved ones, but once they got access to cameras, families started posing with their dead relatives. Literally. Families would often keep the bodies of their dead loved one in the house for days after their passing in order to have that mourning period, but soon they started staging photo shoots with the remains of their relatives, posing them and dressing them up to make it look like they're still alive. Family members would take pictures with the deceased to have one last family portrait before burying their loved one. It's kind of heartwarming in a way, but also really creepy. At number nine, emigration. During the Victorian era, there was unfortunately a lot of orphan children living in the streets of London. It became a pretty big problem because of the sheer amount of young people without homes or families. It was estimated that around 30,000 children were living on the streets in London in 1869. Soon a program was put into place to try and solve this issue and people started rounding up these orphan kids and shipping them off elsewhere to work in some of the British colonies. Many of the kids who were shipped off ended up working as farmhands or as domestic servants. 
Though many children were shipped off to places like New Zealand and Australia, the majority of them went to Canada. About 80,000 of them actually. They were sent away with hopes that they would be able to live better lives, but unfortunately for many of those kids, they didn't end up having any better luck in compared to when they lived on the streets. This practice ended up becoming pretty controversial as you can imagine. Number 8. Relaxative Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've gathered this by now here on Bumblebee. But these messy new illnesses were putting lots of pressure on medical practitioners, so they were desperate for these new treatments. We laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried, okay? They at least tried. They also achieved many medical breakthroughs as well. But when it comes to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, well, that wasn't one of them. That was not our finest hour. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, let that sink in for a moment. I have chicken pox, what should I do? Well, try some laxatives. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Who would have thought? You thought you were uncomfortable before, castor oil, yeah, chug that, and then now you're even weaker, now you're dead. Number seven, backed up. Let's say it's the Victorian era and let's say you're constipated, right? It happens, you know? Well, bad ideas will most likely follow, if you didn't already guess that. According to Merck's 1899 medical manual, small amounts of strychnine were prescribed to those who were constipated. Yeah, the strychnose nux vomica was thought to better the gastric functions. Even a small amount of this stuff would attack your respiratory system. You'd contract, you convulse, it's horrible. It'd be a painful way to go out. It's much, much worse than being constipated. Any day. I would much rather be constipated than any type of strychnine, are you kidding me? Number six, leeches. I grew up with hearing problems. I've been around the block with earaches, ear infections. I had ear tubes numerous times, all that jazz. So I feel really bad for the folks in this next one, okay? I hear you, pun intended. In the Victorian era, medical practitioners would say to use leeches for your ear infections. That's the number one trick, they don't want you to know. There it is. Once they're attached to you, the idea was that they can numb pain while at the same time providing proteins and peptides to its host. So on paper, again, the idea made sense. But the science didn't quite follow, did it? It wasn't entirely hopeless though. Recently in 2004, the FDA reintroduced leeches to the medical world, yeah, because their bite can break up blood clots and induce blood flow. So it's not entirely hopeless. We talked about leech collectors on this channel before, so of course we have to talk about more of the science that they were hoping to achieve with it, right? Also, I worked at a retirement home when I was 16. I thought that job sucked. Imagine being a leech collector? No way. Number five, cat attacks. If I had to pick, I would of course say I'm 100% a dog person. I got, I'm sorry, I grew up with two cats, I'm allergic. I grew up with two dogs, not allergic. Dog guy all the way, sorry. Cats are cool, but this next story just totally freaked me out. Back in 1870, this rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. How lovely is that? She had tons of cats, she loved all of them, and they loved her. Again, I'm allergic, so this, I'm already sneezing just reading about this story. It was the 1800s, okay? A lot of candles, everything was obviously extremely flammable, and disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out at this young woman's home. The cats were trapped inside the house. Now, they made it outside, don't freak out or anything, they all made it out. But by the time the two maids had kicked the door open to rescue said cats, they had gone full primal. They were afraid, they were freaking out. They were just scratching their way out through anyone and everything. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both sadly attacked by all of these cats. What a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives. I pulled my cat's tail when I was younger. I learned real quick uh, never to do that ever again. Number four, hiccups. Today we have many cures for hiccups, yeah. You gotta get scared or hold your breath or drink water like while you're doing a handstand. I don't know, everyone's got weird ideas, whatever. But nothing was as dangerous as the Victorian era hiccup cure, yeah. Ready for this one, don't try it. This one's scarier than a jump scare, that's for sure. In 1899, again, in the good old Merck Medical Manual, it recommended using chloroform to cure your hiccups. Uh? Yeah, just completely damage your entire nervous system and poison your kidneys, for sure. To get rid of hiccups, that's way better. This 19th century anesthetic was not a solution. Never try this. Continue scaring your family and friends. That's definitely the way we handle hiccups now. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Yeah, was it watching what you eat, maybe counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership, something like that? Nope, nope, and no way. No, it was way easier than all those things combined. Can you believe that? And you didn't even have to pull back on how much you were consuming. Doesn't this sound fascinating? What is this? Well, all you needed was a handy tapeworm. 
Yep, I don't have one. I don't know why I pointed. That'd be gross if I had one. Yeah, tapeworm. You know those things that can kill you today if you get one? See, the plan was if you eat a tapeworm egg, okay, it will later hatch in your stomach and at that point you could just eat anything you wanted. Because every time you ate, the tapeworm would also eat. So you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, right? Tapeworm cis pills or go for a jog. Your call. Number two, Victoria's reign. Queen Victoria's reign started in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death later on in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever get the crown. Then one by one, out of nowhere, all of her family members began passing away suddenly. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and grandfather father both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old and already she was next in line for the throne. That's how fast it happens. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before, it's, it's pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from mates or family members, anything fun or social, you name it. Her mother did this to keep her Pure, of course, to keep her the most pure lady. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up. That's it. I'm like, hey, me too. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lennington, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoire. I mean, only three friends growing up, that's cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was finally queen. Yeah, she couldn't walk down the hallway alone at any point. She had to always walk with her mother by her side, even to the washroom, that's crazy. Victoria has reflected on her childhood since, and yeah, she hates John Conroy for manipulating her mother, and she actually refers to him as Demon Incarnate, so. That's good, it's a nice nickname. Incarnate, incarnate. He's a demon, he's the worst. Let's just call him that. And finally, number one, royal enemies. Being the queen and all, a security team is of course needed at all times. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young Queen Victoria. The first attack was back in 1840. It was a young guy named Edward Oxford and he attacked the queen's carriage. Just ran at it like a crazy guy. Obviously, then thankfully, nothing happened. But when Edward was later accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again, but this time it was two men attacking the carriage. And then in 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit the carriage with his cane. He was going nuts as well. Everyone wants this carriage. This is like the ultimate, no one's getting through this carriage, apparently. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook after all these events. Then again in 1842, 1849, 1872, attempt after attempt, it was horrifying. But then things got a little worse with a man named Boy Jones. Yeah, this guy stalked the queen from 1838 until 1841. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. He knew a way in just to Buckingham Palace, which should never be a thing in the first place. And the weird part is here, Boy Jones, once he was inside the palace, he would hide under the queen's sofa. And he would also just sit on her throne for hours, just hanging out. Yeah, he would pretend he's Cersei Lannister and just sit on the throne for a minute or two. Think about life. Eventually, thankfully, he got caught, but Imagine coming home and Boyd Jones is sitting on your couch. You're like, what are you doing? Take that shirt off, get out of here. Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back 
into time. Because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, knock her up. No, not like that. God, look. I despise my alarm clock. It wakes me out of my deeply deserved beauty sleep at 6 a.m. every weekday morning. Now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is a knocker up, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. If you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but I hate you. The people at the time were somewhat friendlier than they are now, and I'm sure the knocker-upper wasn't a horrible person, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy gills who would put their hand on your chest for doing this to them. Number seven, a phrenologist. I think if this YouTube thing doesn't work out for me, I'm gonna go and make up a science. It worked for phrenologists. They claimed that a person's personality, character traits, and abilities could all be figured out by bumps and indents on a person's skull. Characteristics like secretiveness, amativeness, conjugality, and combativeness were apparently controlled by areas of the brain that they called organs of the brain. The idea was dismissed by the church, but it nonetheless gained traction through Europe and was really popular in the States. The idea that you could modify these organs through self-control and practice sounded really good to self-help gurus at the time. If only it was real. Number six, a dog whipper. Looking for someone who absolutely despises dogs and doesn't mind being despised by the rest of us otherwise known as a dog whipper. Back in the day, huntsmen would often hunt foxes and nail their tails to church doors, which would attract dogs of the streets. You'd also have churchgoers who would bring their dogs with them to church. These dogs were not allowed in though, so they'd all have to wait outside. You know how dogs are though. They didn't just sit there waiting patiently. I'm sure some good boys and girls did, but more often than not, they'd be playing and sometimes fighting, disrupting the church services. Enter the dog whipper, who was armed with tongs to grab a dog and remove it from the church grounds, and a whip that would be used on the loudest of the poor pooches. Number five, a rat catcher. I know this will make a few of you out there squirm in your seats. Rats in Victorian England were a massive problem. They were everywhere every nook and cranny of your house, from the basement to the pipes. There was even an account of them spilling over from royal parks. So of course, where there is a problem, there is a job. Rat catchers were pretty famous throughout the Victorian era and were highly praised in society, but the job wasn't too glamorous. You'd be going into the dark, dirty places where rats would make their homes and catching and often killing thousands of rats a year. Often rat catchers would use other animals like dogs and ferrets to help them hunt down the rats too. I don't know though, it's gonna be me. Number four, an upright worker. Upright workers, otherwise known as chimney sweeps, actually started off being children as young as the age of four. The smaller size of the little kiddos was perfect for fitting inside and climbing up and down chimneys. The little suckers would rub their elbows and knees up against the brick of the chimney so much that they would be scraped raw before callousing. Isn't that lovely? No, no it's not. It's horrible. Some children were deliberately underfed to keep them small enough to do the job. Some of them would get permanent lung damage from the dust and smut and smoke from the chimney. Some kids even got stuck in the chimneys. Thank the Lord they eventually passed a law that would make it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to be a chimney sweep. But even then, tis not a profession many would like to have. Number three, matchstick makers. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era. They definitely existed, as the first one was invented in 1823, but it was not exactly a portable thing. So matches were your match. The first match was invented in 1805, but it sucked. The first friction activated match came about in 1826, and they were made with white phosphorus, which is extremely toxic. But they didn't have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by teenage girls and in the worst of conditions too. Forget protective gear. 
Oh, you wanna take your lunch break away from the highly toxic white phosphorus? Oh, no, no, no. That's right. These girls would have to eat their lunch at their workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Mmm, yes, my favorite seasoning. Number two. Resurrectionists. Back in the day, medical schools who wished to study the human body only really had access to the bodies of criminals who had hit the end of the line. There actually weren't too many of these bodies around, which led to a good price for bodies that were in reasonably good condition, other than being deceased. This wasn't exactly the greatest idea, as now you've created an opportunity for people with no morals or empathy to go and dig up fresh graves, becoming resurrectionists. A cool name for an absolutely god-awful profession, if you could call it that. The problem was bad enough that people would actually guard the graves of their recently deceased loved ones. No one should have to do that. Number one, Night Soil Man. All right, if you need me, I'll be depositing my night soil over in the toilet. Poop. Night soil is poop. And the night soil man? Well, you see, before we had real sewer systems, the night soil you deposited at home would go into a lovely hole in the ground. As you can imagine, these would tend to fill up over time, and that's when you have your night soil man come in. Yes, his job was to clear out the poop deposits from houses and cart it away in the middle of the night so nobody in polite society would have to see it. But they were always in business, so that makes the job a little less crappy. Getting us started at number 10 is top hats. A top hat is an iconic image. You can see them in old black and white movies or on logos such as Mr. Peanut. But why were top hats created and why were they so trendy? Well, there's multiple reasons actually. Men and women were already wearing hats and bonnets to protect their heads from rain, wind, and the soot from local smokestacks. As a result, hats were already quite a trendy wear. However, the true reason for its popularity is what it represented. The top hat quickly became symbolic of status power, and masculinity. From 1850 to 1900, men wore top hats for business, pleasure, and formal occasions. Certain colors were even associated with certain times of day. For example, a black top hat was for day or night, making its wearer feel taller, more handsome, even suave. Some were even reported to be a height of 12 to 14 inches tall. Top hats, amongst other hats of this era, also required ridiculous upkeep, such as being brushed, boiled regularly, powdered, etc. They also also tend to contain mercury poison. As time progressed, we found other ways to overcompensate as well as accessorize our heads, so it's easier to see why the top hat never made a comeback. Number 9 in the countdown is women and their flirty fans. When you see a gentleman caller across the room, you may want to send him a hint that you're picking up the vibe that his top hat is putting out. What better way than sublimial messaging with an item you're already carrying? In Victorian times, women carried fans due to fainting spells, which were really just the result of their excess excessively tight and heavy garments, something we'll cover later in the video. In 1827, a fan maker from Paris, Doubleroy, published a leaflet explaining the language behind the uses of a fan. Some examples were twirling the fan in the right hand meant that I love another. Meanwhile, drawing the fan across the cheek told someone special that I love you. A fan half opened and pressed to the lips gave permission for a kiss. However, it is rumored that the less romantic truth is that the fan etiquette, such as Duvalroy's leaflet, was invented in order to boost the sales of fans in the 19th century after they had fallen out of fashion following the French Revolution. Irregardless of rumors, it appears in olden times some people were using fans to get hot rather than cool down. Number 8. Shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night, kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. See, all gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, 
be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. This makes sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair. Not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive it. Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car, or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bedsheets with the gal that you love, 
or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No. I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening Mr. Barrows, you must excuse my tardiness, there was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. You're what was showing love? Oh you hurdle it, I can't believe it, excuse me, I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle, ladies. Wear what you want, do what you want. Number eight, funeral mute. Funeral suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as f now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard so a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number seven, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary to say the least but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just. Woo! It was horrible. That's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poo-pourri. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray and after you go, you just... You hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2", I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five, 
Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over, and then they would go and Disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got. That's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lose were victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on Bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver or bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it, and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting workers in the area. Now at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never going to know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's all blind yourself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria, she's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but 
Uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger, as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the Queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, thieves. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. Well, a woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight. The Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes. The wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, calf ear appetizers. This one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me, because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost, honestly, I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or God forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, they would act, uh, ooh. Well, I don't know if they were that down bad, but women of higher esteem wore gloves. There's, there's etiquette to gloves. It was all part of the, the culture, which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette. I say no woman should have the cover up. She should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to. However, with the gloves, I believe there's a separate issue. I have an issue being a big dude with asthma. I sweat a lot more than the average folk. It just sucks, but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on, well, I might want to leave them on. Wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for kaffir appetizers because the smell and the sweat, it just, ooh, be gross, ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a pop collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorways. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. 
Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this, though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time. And, and, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello, darling, yes. Ugh, gross. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, Crypt Picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black, cease to exist, the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> like, that's just weird, you know what I mean? It's just weird, it's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old, it won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do, it's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. It's only been speculated, and some studies suggest that it has been revealed, but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty, and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency, as it's really just horrible, and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right, ladies, I'm on your side. Number 10, no calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally, that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver-tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7-Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft, call on a man? <laughs> no way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill-bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes, I'm a little lonely. Number nine, act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, oh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Oh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, 
You do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, cause that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great, just gonna lay down. <laughs> Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she, she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I really, I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comments section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to mix with cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Oh, well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards, but that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always gonna make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want, you can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderlyn, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy. Anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted, bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. However, some were still not pleased. A one John Wilkes Booth, to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Nazi, Nazi, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an ax, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene, and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange, because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty 
get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and what? Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody my bloody shorts here. What? Whoa, who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough, sure, but Mary Ann Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. Well, that's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husbands and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time, like 50 years ahead of her time. That's that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also it's also like cold-blooded, cl calculated, unaliving, you know. But but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Mary Ann Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair, that's good. Don't let her cook, Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London, whoo baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Right, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh, loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it. Just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies' underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms. Which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number nine, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush, and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS, or Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today, you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere, and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gonna have her options. She's gonna be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Speaking of keeping it cool, next in our countdown at number eight is bottomless underwear. While showing a bit of ankle may have made you a harlot, in the Victorian era, every woman was walking around with crotchless undergarments. But these strange underoos were invented with a justified purpose. Due to the amount of fabric layers, steel crinolines, and tight bodices and dresses, women of the era didn't really have time to spend an hour undressing before nature calls. By creating undergarments that had holes aligned with the wearer's groin, a woman's only mission would be to hoist up as many 
many layers as she could before popping a squat. Don't be fooled however, that wasn't exactly easy either. Some of you may wonder, what happened if Aunt Flo paid a visit while a woman was wearing an open bottom undergarment? Well, in Victorian times, menstruation hygiene was perceived very different and women quite literally let it flow. If you want to learn more, search that one up on your own. As fashion evolved and women wore fewer and lighter clothes in the early 20th century, pulling down undergarments from underneath bustles and cages was no longer a nightmare, so the crotchless undergarment was soon abandoned once more. But now it does make sense why everyone loved the high kicking can can dancers in 19th century Paris. Morning garb, and I don't mean pajamas, is number 7 in our countdown. Known as the monarch of mourning, Queen Victoria influenced how grieving women dressed and behaved in Europe and the United States after the passing of her husband in 1861. She famously mourned him for 40 years until her own demise and started what's now known as the Victorian mourning etiquette. Victorian mourning etiquette came with elaborate rituals to commemorate their dead. It became normal to have incredibly elaborate and lavish funerals, curtail social behavior, and even erect statues and ornate monuments as tombstones. Mourning clothes were part of this and they were introduced for both sexes. Said to show a family's outward display of their inner feelings after the passing of a loved one, the rules for who wore what and for how long were complicated and often outlined in popular journals or household manuals. Call that a mourner's magazine. Jokes aside, men definitely had it a lot easier. They simply wore their usual dark suits along with black gloves, hat bands, cravats, or ties. For women, especially should she be a widow, there were different levels of mourning and garb to wear as you progressed out of deep mourning and into lighter mourning and so forth. Deep mourning uh, was of course black, but also made specifically was a crepe styling, a scratchy silk with a puffed crimped appearance associated with mourning as it doesn't pair with any other clothing. Right. The mourner would eventually stop donning the crepe and then stop donning black. This was called slightening the mourning before cloth colors eventually moved on to gray, mauve, then white until the mourning period was considered complete. Number six in our countdown is the human hair wearers. Fun because it rhymes but creepy for a whole slew of reasons. So what do I mean by human hair wearers? Well it was a tradition in Victorian era to don jewelry that had segments of human hair embossed, woven, or sealed into it. But for many Victorian people, the amount of hair involved in remembering loved ones went far beyond a little lock in a necklace. In stores and women's magazines, you could find patterns for wreaths made of hair and wire, often floral designs. Bracelets, brooches, earrings, and necklaces were also all very common. In its prime, human hair, jewelry, and decor was considered incredibly fashionable. It's even said that swapping locks of hair was a love token between women loving women or friends the way that girls today might wear friendship bracelets with each other. I guess if you need a trim and you were already late on a birthday gift, you could really just kill two birds with one stone. Number 5 in the countdown is all about buggy dresses. The wealthy Victorians were very into the grandeur, looking to feed a fascination with culture especially. Beetle wing embroidery was at a peak of fame in the 18th century India and was quickly appropriated by English visitors while military occupied the country from 1858 to 1948. A litra, which is the hard casing over a beetle's wing, first appeared on dresses and experienced their first burst of popularity in England by the 1820s, though English women in India had likely been donning it since at least the 1780s. Material used was often white or other pale colors to help augment the reflective green tones of the beetle wing. This visual was made possible when a litra was paired with zardozi, a gold embroidery style often done on colored cottons or silks. Victorians at least didn't appropriate everything about the art form. They made patterns and styles of their own for the dresses. Elytra was sewn onto the gowns in an imitation of live beetle patterns, a reflection of Victorian interest in naturalism and zoology. Not sure why anyone wants to look like they have live bugs crawling on them, but... Okay. Number four is the casual ball gown. One of the most notable shifts in Victorian time was that fashion began to be differentiated by gender rather than class. This reflected the changing roles of women in society. And let me say, every part of Victorian women's fashion seems tortuous. You start your day layering on long crotchless underwear and tunics before strapping a metal cage to your waist. You then wear an average of six skirts over that, alongside bodices and corsets that would forever change the placement of your organs and potentially even suffocate you to death. The reported average weight of a Victorian dress when fully on could be anywhere between 14 and 22 pounds. But the risk doesn't end there. In fact, it was everywhere. It was estimated that between the 1850s and 1860s, 3,000 
thousand women in England died from their crinolines catching fire, as airy fabrics and hoop supported skirts also allowed for plenty of air to circulate beneath a dress, which could also make a small flame grow out of control in seconds. In 1864, the New York Times reported that 40,000 women worldwide perished from dress related fires. Another common occurrence was to see them pulled into machinery after walking too close and having some of the skirts catch in exposed parts. Yikes. It's no wonder that the large ball gown crinolines phased out in the late 1800s, but then bustles came in and they were worse in different ways. While more practical as it was slim on the sides and the front, it required women to sacrifice movement and comfort in order to achieve a fashionable shape like the corset did. They began to alter women's spines, ribs and organs over time as they required women to twist their bodies completely in order to be able to sit down. Overall, while movies and TV may make these beautiful gowns seem whimsical and ethereal, they truly were just death traps. Number 3 in the countdown is bird brained. I enjoy my puns, but there's a reason for that one. This trend was started by the notorious Marie Antoinette, a rebel in the French courts for her outlandish fashion and accessories. Amongst her pile of powdered curls, Marie was often seen with feathered caps and bonnets. While this look became an envy for women across America and Europe, the trend did struggle to take off initially as much of the aristocracy was perturbed by it. However, a trend is a trend, and eventually the English society was persuaded. They donned mainly ostrich, pheasant, or peacock feathers at first. Eventually, entire songbirds were stuffed after their death and adorned these hats. By the late 1800s, the plume trade had decimated several species of birds, including flamingos, birds of paradise, and rosy spoonbirds. Topping the endangered list were the snowy and great egrets, as at one point their pure white feathers were worth more than gold. Promoters of the feather trade knew what they were doing and also knew that the public didn't understand the carnage that their fashion was sieging on these animals. They held that wearing feathers and whole birds brought city dwellers closer to nature, that it improved people's awareness and knowledge of bird species. Thankfully, it's due to the inevitable public awareness and then disapproval that bird hat sales diminished and went out of trend altogether. Number 2 slot in the countdown is Paris Green. It seemed Parisian aristocracy had a chokehold on the globe with their trends. It's believed Empress Eugenie was to have worn a dress so stunning at the Paris Opera one evening in 1864 that it was featured in newspapers globally the next day. It was a deep yet vibrant green, one rumored to almost glow in darkness. The green of Paris quickly became the hue of the social elite. So how was Paris green made and why was it so dangerous? The color was discovered when chemists combined copper and arsenic poison. The result was a dye brighter than all the other greens available on the market. Copper wasn't what gave this color its iconic nickname however. Arsenic is a highly hazardous substance that causes skin sores, vomiting, diarrhea, and in some circumstances cancers or death, as we know now. But they didn't. When factory workers arms and hands began to wilt away from sores and decay that could only be connected to the dye, French and German governments enacted legislation prohibiting the production of arsenic based pigments. It's the right thing to do. Meanwhile, the British government mainly ignored them. Even when Matilda Schreuer famously died of arsenic poisoning with the whites of her eyes stained green from her working in factories. This was deemed accidental poisoning by the government at the time. Paris green remained popular in England until ironically it just went out of trend. It's a little bit of an abrupt ending honestly. No justice for those exposed in workplaces or compensation for suffering. But nothing takes the cake quite like the Victorian trend of looking dead, which is number one in our countdown. You'd figure people look dead enough as is inhaling arsenic and mercury from their clothes and shoes and hats constantly, let alone their home decor. But looking dead was the fashion of the day. This look was specifically modeled after how tuberculosis affected you. Pale skin, watery eyes, red lips. While this disease was decimating the lower status, higher status women recreated it with makeup and arsenic consumption. You heard me right. In order to get pale skin, women consumed arsenic. In order to not die from arsenic, the consumer had to follow a careful process, eating small doses to build up a tolerance. Now, arsenic is addictive, so if they at any point stopped the consumption, they would experience withdrawals such as vomiting, stomach pains, convulsions, hair loss, nervous system failure, kidney failure, delusions, the list goes on. Some women were stuck taking it for the rest of their lives. For the desired watery eye look, women would put citrus or even perfume in their eyes. Some went farther, using belladonna flower, also known as deadly nightshade, for longer lasting tears. However being poisonous, little wonder why blindness was a widely reported as a symptom of belladonna drops. 
No wonder it did such a good job. Red lip paint included? You guessed it, more poison. In this case, usually lead. All of these poisonous products would contribute to illnesses and facial decay. Death was of course a long term side effect of the usage once poisoning reached its crescendo. Suffice to say, while you may really want to fit in, some trends are not worth getting on board for, especially if they'll slowly melt your face off. Number 10, train engine cleaner. Ever wanted to get inside a small hole in the engine of a train and shovel out the coal that was left in there? Ever wanted to go underneath a train where you can't fully stand up in the middle of the night and rake out a dusty ash pan, getting all kinds of ash and stuff in your mouth? Perfect! You can go join up with the railroad as a train engine cleaner. These guys would spend their days shoveling five to six tons of coal into the furnace of the steam trains, and then spend their nights climbing into said furnace, cleaning it out, and then going out in the middle of the freezing cold, wet night into a trench covered in water and oil and dust, and get right up under that sucker and pull out all the ashes and dust and crap that came out of the engine while it had been running all day. Now Number 9. Linker Boy or Linker Men Before the introduction of gas lights on the streets of London, the only gas lighting came in the form of small children who made you believe that you wouldn't be able to walk the streets without them tagging along with a torch to help guide your way. Then they'd expect a tip from you. Oh, rascals. They weren't so bad. They were generally pretty helpful in getting you from point A to point B while being able to see one foot in front of the other. And their charge was usually just one farthing, or the equivalent of a quarter. The linker boy, like a lot of the jobs on this list, was actually featured in a lot of art and literature from the time, and there were even some rather infamous ones, like Lawrence Casey, who was the personal linker boy for the courtesan Betty Careless. Number 8. Charged with love Naturally this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't going to happen, they, they just weren't going to be approved of it, it's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel. Or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Austin Powers would say, that's just not very groovy baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together. But given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. 
I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five, big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me, and it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no, commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did, and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really, I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad. So a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, I'm not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching, so sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms. But that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Because science. 